All right. Again, welcome to Rebels with a Heart, our final episode of 2023. And this episode is called CEOs Unwrapped. So we're going to have the perspectives and the reflections of 2023, as well as looking forward to 2024 from a few of these guests, which I'm excited to bring with you today, friends and colleagues of mine, and welcome to the show. Uh, we're going to get started right now. So Jennifer McCollum, please tell us a little bit about who you are, your story, your journey through leadership, what's going on in your world and your life. Uh, we're excited to hear from you. And you're on mute, by the way. That's the best part about Zoom. I was I was laughing at your introduction because it started with CEOs unwrapped. And I started yes. thinking about that in the context of the holidays. And I thought, well, I guess it's better than CEOs unhinged. So <laughs> Uh, Jennifer McCollum, I am the CEO of Linkage. It is a global leadership development firm, and I love our mission. It is to change the face of leadership. So I have had the honor, the privilege of serving as the CEO for the last five and a half years. We sold the company to SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, a little over a year ago. And so the big news for me this year is after integrating the company and launching a book and hosting 2,000 women at our Women in Leadership Institute, I officially announced yesterday that I will be stepping away as the CEO and starting my new chapter because the integration has gone so beautifully. I have worked my way out of a job and I plan to spend some time uh, at home in the mountains skiing, at home in DC, in the mountains skiing with my three children over the holidays and um, with my wonderful husband of 25 years. Well-deserved and congratulations and welcome to Rebels with a Heart. Thank you. Doug, coming over to you, and I love the background. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. Uh, appreciate the street cred boost by being on the podcast with such household names. And I got to say, uh, Jeremy, Jennifer, I apologize being paired up with a bug. It may not get you much corporate utility, um, <laughs> but I think there may be some bonus points for people watching just to maybe see some good old-fashioned mentorship at work. And all sincerity, um, grateful to be here. And uh, Derek, grateful for all that you do on this podcast, Life Guides, and all that, that that impacts people. So by way of introduction, so Doug Carden, I grew up in a small little town called Farmington, New Mexico. Sometimes I have to remind people New Mexico is one of the 50 states, and <laughs> English was my first language, but currently reside in Chandler, Arizona, just outside of uh, the Phoenix area, married to an amazing wife, uh, seven beautiful children. I think that I consider those my greatest accomplishments, but I think here on the podcast, I'm also the co-CEO and co-founder of uh, EcoShield Pest Control. We're a, a nationwide pest control company. We have 40 locations in 23 states, have a, a passion for people, our people in particular. I, I think every uh, CEO or leader is, is biased towards the, their own people, but grateful for all the good that they do to spread happiness around the world and grateful to be here. Great for you to be here as well. And yeah, for just a bug guy, you're building quite an amazing business, which we'll get to get that dug. So welcome to the show. And Jeremy, coming over to you. Go pig or go home, as they say. Go pig or go home. Uh, well, I'm Jeremy Andrus. Nice to be here. Uh, CEO of Trader Grills. Um, I uh, bought, bought this business about 10 years ago with a private equity partner. Uh, it was a uh, you know, smallish 27-year-old uh, brand located in Oregon um, and, and really with its customer base in Pacific Northwest, uh, went through some interesting experiences and decided to uh, shut down the, the headquarter office and move it to Utah, where I had uh, built built a brand uh, from startup called Skull Candy. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, learning to be a CEO. Uh, I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. Uh, Traeger is the biggest company I've ever run. And, you know, as, as I as I acknowledge my team from time to time, I'm making it up every day, but loving the journey. It has not been a smooth journey the last handful of years, but uh, but it's been a good one. Uh, live in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, have been here almost 20 years um, and have uh, six children. And so life life is not slow. It's amazing. Well, welcome to the show, Jeremy. Looking forward to digging in with you and your story and the the ups and downs of that entrepreneurial and CEO journey. Uh, so again, for everyone on the on the show, uh, including our guest, Derek Winston, I'm the host of Rebels with the Heart, which is a show geared towards highlighting leadership and people first leadership and cultures in action. And it's been a blessing over the last four years to do that. I'm also the president and chief cultural officer of Life Guides, which is a technology platform that connects people to share their life experiences and stories 
in service of other people to help them thrive and reduce their struggles in life. Uh, and we support enterprises in doing that. So with that, we're going to jump into our, our conversation. And I'm going to start kind of with the look back. And I'm going to kind of ask you all to think for a moment. Uh, when you think of 2023, there's a kind of a trend right now. How does it, how can be summed up for you in one word? What's the one word that you would use to describe 2023? I'm not going to do it looking forward. I'm going to do it looking backward on this mind because I think that that word can kind of lead us down some interesting paths depending on how you answer that question. So, and any of you can take that in any order. There's no rules on Rebels. So feel free to chime in if you have your word or when you have your word. I'll jump in. Satisfying is a word that I would use. And, 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 and by itself, it doesn't mean anything, but it's, uh, it's relative to, to, to where we've been. Very nice. Closure would be my word. I mean, and, and I'll explain that later if you'd like. Yes, absolutely. And I think I would probably say growth. Personally, professionally with the company, there was just a lot of growth in 2023. And my word is gratitude for what it's worth. So but we're going to talk about all of you. So why don't we start? We'll just go back that order. What, what made 2023 satisfying? What made 2023 a year of closure? What made 2023 a year of growth for each of you? And feel free to expand upon that a little bit, whichever one of you wants to take with it. Sure. So, so, um, you know, I think, I think the, the, the context or history of, of, of Traeger is important. We had, we had a lot of years of growth. Uh, we had some, some tricky early, early years after buying the business. Uh, but then we grew for a number of years and, uh, Pandemic uh, was a nice tailwind for our business, uh, but at the end of the pandemic, everything imploded. It was it was the hardest, by far the hardest period of my career ever, which I thought I'd already had, and I didn't think I would have another one of those. But um, you know, we we went from feeling like we could uh, do no wrong to feeling like we could do no right, and 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 candidly, we we hadn't done anything differently in our business. But the the confluence of a of a lot of factors uh, as the pandemic ended just made business really really messy and complicated. Um, you know, supply chains uh, just were, were, were just a, a disaster. Uh, cost increase, inflation, notably in transportation uh, costs from Asia. We produce a lot in Asia. Our inventory is big and heavy. And our transportation costs went up by six, six, seven fold. Oh. Um, and then we moved into the spring of 22. And typically we have a nice seasonal bump in our business. And uh, it didn't really happen in the spring of 22. And, and 10 years in, I had never seen that. But uh, consumers went from two years of buying anything they could get their hands on, uh, particularly home goods, home furnishings, grills. We, we certainly benefited uh, to deciding they were done buying the discretionary durables. They wanted to travel. They want to go to Europe, Hawaii. They want to see Taylor Swift. <laughs> and 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 the, the, I had never seen uh, in the 20 plus years that I'd been in consumer such a dramatic shift by in, in consumer behavior. The only other time I'd seen it yeah. was March of 2020. Yeah. And we all know what happened then. And so um, you know, it was challenging. We we had a lot of leverage on our balance sheet. We have four hundred million dollars of debt wow. uh, from a transaction that we did a few years ago, uh, and we sat on a lot of inventory. And so, you know, the last time that I had been so focused on liquidity is when I ran uh, a three person business called Skull Candy, <laughs> and I would check, I would check the checking account every day. And some days we had positive five hundred dollars, and some days we had negative five hundred dollars. <laughs> we were overdrawn and uh, it was hard. It, it was hard for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, we had to make some difficult decisions. We had to let 20% of our team go. Um, and uh, we had to shut down some parts of the business that we really cared about. And it was, it, it was personally difficult for me. It, it was a moment where, you know, I felt the weight of the world and uh and, 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 and the reason I provide that context is 23 was a hard year as well, yeah. but on a relative basis, after having made some really difficult decisions, uh, we were able to, we were able to perform yeah. and, uh, it was not a record breaking year. Um, but, uh, the team got closer together. 
There was a lot more unity. The culture got better. Um, culture is, um, you know, I, I'm such a such a believer that culture really leads to to great outcomes. And you know, in 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 the hardest moments in 22, I felt like culture was suffering because performance was suffering. And so figuring out how to decouple performance and culture and really just get aligned as a team in a hard moment leaves me, you know, at the end of this year, just feeling really satisfied. We haven't won. We're not winning. Um, which like, we definitely prefer that. Um, but, but relative to the adversity that, that we had been through as a team and that I had been through as a leader, I finish the year feeling really grateful that we're stable uh, and, and, and we're sort of, we're aligned and we're enjoying the experience of, of maneuvering the heart together. Amazing. Well, well, well done on that, Jeremy. And thank you for sharing so openly and vulnerably, frankly, with the group. You don't know us that well um, and with our audience, that, that experience. And we're going to dig in more to that. And uh, it sounds like you've earned this milestone. There's more to come on that. And I'm going to dig into some of the things that you shared and some of the things I'm really curious about um, in that story. Anything resonate or anything kind of where, where you like to tail your word in, from that, Jennifer or Doug, uh, with that introduction? I, I'll go actually, it's because it's almost the reverse story from what Jeremy told. You know, I had that, you know, the, the 2020 to 2021 time period was so bad for our business that I wasn't sure we were going to come out of it. So while, while grills, <laughs> well, while, while grilling was really big in 2020 and 2021, live leadership development was not. And whether it was our multi-million dollar conference business or our training business or our coaching business, everything had been wrapped up in a lot of in-person and custom work that we had to completely transform. Um, and and then and it was it was really hard. Our clients were experiencing it as well. So when I say closure, you know, I had committed in 2018 when I when I took on the private equity backed portfolio company CEO role that I was going to transform the business and I was going to uh, digitize it and scale it uh, and ensure that we could have a greater impact and create greater valuation. And I was failing on that promise in 2020 and 2021. We took a huge step backwards. We had to lay off one third of our staff. But then what happened across 2022 and three is the very transformation strategy that we'd put in place uh, pre-pandemic as we grew back out of it to try and even equal where we were in 2018, it was a completely different company. So we grew aligned to the very strategy because clients didn't have another choice. They needed to access our virtual and our digital platforms. They needed to engage with us in a different way. And so by 2022, I could look at the private equity boards and say, we're headed the right direction, but we don't know what's going to happen in 2023 with the pending recession. And it might be a good time in 2022 to take the company to market, even though it feels a little premature coming out of the pandemic. And as it turned out, that was the right decision because we found a home that was a strategic investor. And so closure to me was selling the company at the end of 2022, integrating the company across 2023, launching a book, which had been part of my personal vision. And it happens that the book aligned beautifully with the work we do at Linkage. So it's a, you know, a, a linkage book to help advance women leaders in the world. And it feels now that I'm ending the year with a lot of visions, uh, like a vision complete and promises fulfilled. Did it go perfectly? Absolutely not. But the culture that we created in that pre-pandemic time sustained us through the worst of the times. And it really helped us as we integrated into the new organization and of finding our way into what do the two organizations together look like and feel like. And that's what I'm leaving with now. Beautiful. Congratulations on all aspects of that. I know how hard the integration process is, how hard this transaction process is, and to then launch a book on top of that uh, at the same time. Well, well done, Jennifer. So thank you. Doug, coming over to you to, to share your thoughts. And yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, hearing Jeremy talk about kind of the the startup, the war stories, I can definitely appreciate the times, you know, where you're starting out, you're looking at the bank account and you're scratching your head and wondering how everything's going to come together. But for us, the last two years, uh, we've been very fortunate. Uh, I think it's a, a culmination, uh, a compounding of a lot of 
great people and a lot of great culture and and the model that we have as an organization. And so extremely grateful. The last two years have been our, our biggest years. Uh, but I think that's also because of that, it's become our, our biggest challenge. And 2023 in particular was the biggest year that we ever had as a, an organization. So we we added 185,000 new customers in about five to six months, all, all organically. Uh, and, and that, just to put it in perspective, would put you in the top 10 uh, in terms of size of pest control companies in the in the country. So you're essentially, you know, how do you build an organization that size and plan for it? And there were a lot of challenges. Uh, one of the things we didn't anticipate was a truck shortage. And so we didn't have enough trucks. And that's, you know, one of our, our main assets that we need on the ground. And so we had to coordinate, you know, rental programs and and all kinds of other creative things, uh, hiring. You know, it's one thing if you're hiring one or two people, but when you're hiring 20 or 30 in a location, that can be uh, difficult. Uh, we had a new payroll company with a lot of a lot of challenges there. Our, I think our uh, accounting team, they broke Excel. I didn't know you could do that, but apparently, you know, there's like a million rows in Excel. And when you, when you uh, fill all those up, it doesn't really operate like it should. So we had to move over to a database. And then the CRM that interfaces with our customers uh, was bought by another organization. And they changed a lot of things that really kind of disrupted what we typically do with our people and with customers. And so kind of navigating some of that. Um, our CFO, who's amazing. So one one thing he he compares it to is he says it's like fixing in an airplane while you're flying it. And um, thankfully, you know, we've got some great pilots. Uh, and I think a lot of our people, they must have watched MacGyver back in the day because uh, uh, they were they were really good at audibles, uh, rolling with the punches and and grateful for what they were able to accomplish at the end of it, but definitely not without a few bumps and bruises along the way. Well done. Congratulations to that, Doug. I mean, that's amazing. It's just, I'm struck by something here that each of you share just, and this is, I think, a consequence to some extent of the pandemic. It's just that some businesses are surging and growing at phenomenal rates and other businesses are really struggling. And that was the case to your point, Jen, in 2020. And now it's flipping and we're seeing that just that hyper-personalization and shift in businesses. And even some companies that are simultaneously hiring and doing cuts in different areas within the company at the same time as a result of some of the complexity that we now see just in the global business landscape environment. So one of the topic I want to hone in right now with, with each of you, because you all spoke to it in your own way, and I think you have a different lens on it, is this idea of culture and culture permeating the good times, the challenging times, culminating with hiring people, culminating with having to reduce teams, because these are these are real challenges that I hear in boardrooms rooms and executive teams right now where companies are considering this. How do we how do we hire well and scale well when the market's in a challenging situation? How do we compassionately uh, you know, end our relationship with someone or periodically for a period of time do that sets us up for them to come back in the future while maintaining our growth and our momentum, maintaining a cohesive culture? These are really challenging things to do operationally. And I think that if you could share from your lens on what you're doing and what you've done um, in practical terms, that would be very helpful for our audience to hear. I'm I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, you know, I'd say, um, you know, first of all, just thinking about what what is the what is the role of culture in a business? Um, why why is it important? And it's something that uh, you know, have, having spent time in startups. For a number of years, culture culture happened organically, and and I would say, a good culture a good culture happened uh, because of how we hired, but it wasn't really, I would say, early on deliberate in like really understanding how do we build the right culture for our organization. And I think there are a couple of just really really important components of of culture and, and co having core values that 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 we maintain. Uh, one is that it really connects. It connects vision, vision and values. I, I think there's there's no better way to scale a business than to have, you know, a set of cultural values that that really inform us how we should think, um, you know, so that we're not micromanaging, but people really buy into how we think about uh, accomplishing our vision. Um, the second, I think, is is really the 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 ability to inspire and motivate people. And create an environment where people show up and feel like it brings out their best self, uh, wh whether whether it be in the office or or wherever it is that they spend time outside of the office. You know, I think that's how when when people are growing, 
and they're feeling that they are better people, not just better professionals or better at what they do. Uh, they give a lot more and and they're happier and they stay longer. And uh, none of those things, none of those things are related to short-term performance. And yet, you know, my experience was that uh, when when performance goes sideways, uh, culture is culture really takes a lot more deliberate focus. Um, it's it's easier to live culture, I think, when you're when when you're winning, uh, and there's a lot of celebration and. Uh, but, but, it, but, but I think it's, it's equally easy when you're not winning, when things get tough to, um, to be clinical, to cut corners on culture, uh, to, you, you know, to take all of the pressure that, that you, that you internalize as a leader and push it down. And I think the pressure gets heavier in an organization and, you know, and, 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 and it's, and it's particularly heavy for people that have less experience and maybe their careers don't mean to them what ours do to us as leaders. And so, you know, we, we, we had to go through a lot of those hard things. And, you know, we, we, I, I think it, it, we were probably 12 months into pivoting in the business, figuring out how do we get lean? How do we survive this? When we started really listening more in poll surveys and just like getting this strong vibe that, the culture wasn't as healthy as we believed it was. And we are such a culture first business that uh, hearing that hurt. I mean, it, it, it really hurt culture. Like Traeger was really, you know, when, when we rebuilt the team from scratch uh, 28 years into the business, it was all built on this set of cultural values. And every, you know, I hired every single person, the first 300 people we hired I interviewed because I wanted to filter for these cultural values. And then I realized in a moment um, that we weren't really living them the way that, that we believed. And uh, we had to really step back and, and figure out what are we doing wrong? How do we make sure that culture lives in a tough moment? That's just it's like, that's when you need culture to, to, oh, to thrive. And I, I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the things that I did that was incredibly valuable is uh, I sat down uh, with managers and individual contributors, not with the leaders and leaders I spend so much time with, uh, but in in small groups of five, six, seven people over the course of, you know, close to a year, uh, I met with almost every member of the team and just to ask questions and listen and finding themes. The themes were remarkable. The themes were obvious to the team they weren't obvious to me at the time and so i think it, it always starts with a willingness and part of the willingness was to was to take the hard feedback which is the thing that i profess to believe in the most I, I i wasn't doing well we weren't doing well as a leadership team but then it's about figuring out how do you listen uh how do you listen to opinions and then and, and then how do you turn those into uh into action uh, Jeremy, quick question just to clarify, because you said something that it developed organically, but then at the same time you hired specifically around core values and vision. Was that something you did right at the onset when you came in as CEO of Traeger that you did the vision advisor exercises and then you refreshed on them later in the pandemic? Or what was that process just to clarify? So so yeah, in in and I was referring more to my to to the eight years that I spent building the Skull Candy brand. Okay, got it. Uh, gotcha. the, the the culture and, and I will say the culture felt good until we got to a certain moment. We took the business public. We're the highest shorted stock on the NASDAQ for six months, which is like just like out of 4,000 businesses, people were betting on us to, fa to fail the most. And uh, that's when I realized for the first time that if culture isn't intentionally maintained, it, 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 it can suffer. Yeah. And so at, at, at Traeger, there was, there was a moment in time, there was an impetus to, to sort of start over and rebuild the culture. And it was simply that, uh, you know, I, I, we bought a business that was just toxic. Like it, it, it was a beautiful business that had great bones, but when I got on the inside, I realized it was toxic. And so we were very deliberate in defining what is our vision and what are our values. And then we were very deliberate about saying, as opposed to hiring team and asking team to live values that may not be part of their DNA. How do we use our cultural values to filter every single person that comes in? 
And it worked great for a long time. And by the way, we were winning for a long time. And so, again, I think it's a little bit easier to amplify cultural values when you don't have the adversity of some really challenging business circumstances. But uh, we we got, you know, a year into a year into a tough moment and we realized that, that that we just needed more intentionality that we needed to sort of step back and revisit our roots and i and i really do think that culture is something that uh you know it's either getting better or it's getting worse and if you don't very deliberately live it talk about it recognize it like touch base with people that are connected to it it's just very easy to to let it slide day at a time. Completely agree with all that. We could talk about this for, for quite some time. Jennifer and Doug, I want to invite you in to share your reflections in your world or even just in hearing some memories job there from what Jeremy shared in your in your own journeys. Uh, yeah, I'll go. Um we I, my belief is that there you have a culture in your organization, whether you're intentional or not, right? So culture is the manifestation of how people feel and how they would describe your organization. And I think the question is, I guess, building on Germany, are you intentionally building the culture that you need for your organization to thrive? And thriving may look different, whether you're acquiring, whether you're being acquired, whether you're transforming. And what I got to, to linkage it, had, it was a 30-year-old company and it had a culture and there were some beautiful pieces of that. And there were some pieces that I looked at and talked to the executive team and said, based on where we're going, I'm not sure the culture is going to support and sustain us in getting there. And so I'll just give you one example. The, the culture was such that any tough decision, and they're all tough decisions, were made at the top. And so there was a lot of disempowerment deeper in the organization to make any decision. And I realized we were moving too quickly and we needed everybody to feel like they could engage in the appropriate decisions for their roles. And so we sat around, um, at, and <clears throat> the other thing I'd say about values, and I, I, I love the idea of like, what is, what is the culture we're trying to, trying to create? What are the commitments, the values, the behaviors, the practices, whatever you want to call them that will, it, that will, that we will collectively commit to to get there? And then how do we hold ourselves collectively accountable? In my mind, again, anything you espouse publicly or internally is only as good as our ability to understand them, make them real and reinforce them. So I actually have it by my, um, I don't want to see this. I, I have this by my, my desk everywhere I go because we, we created it together um, and we called it the linkage way. And they ended up being 20 behaviors that you could actually see, measure, reward, honor, but they were the behaviors that rolled up into four categories that said, okay, for us to achieve our vision, it is important that we accelerate our success using these specific behaviors, celebrate our, our community using these specific behaviors. And then we've talked about them and we, we rewarded them and we built them into our performance management system. And we had the big awards ceremony at the uh, twice a year and the team got so into it. That's when you know you're living aligned to your culture when everybody feels like they're a part of it. We actually do this work for organizations as oh. well. Um, and I will say that the when we talk about inclusive cultures of what is the leadership modeling, everyone is looking up to the executive team to say, here's what we're saying. Is this what we're really doing? And they take that model. So how we are as leaders, so, so important. Um, and especially at the executive level and the CEO level. And I guess the other thing, I would, the last thing I would say is that um, when you look at what creates the kind of culture that attracts and retains and supports uh, the development, it's, it's, do people feel like they can leverage their superpowers, their strengths and their skills? Do they feel like they are playing a unique role? And so we spend a lot of time working with organizations and, and, and even ourselves saying, what kinds of your role or your identity or your gender or your sexuality or your level, do you feel like you are able to leverage your superpowers and strengths? And I talked to I talked to Sam yesterday. I'm on my I'm on my way out, so I'm having beautiful conversations with some employees. He's he's 26 and he started at Linkage right out of college, and he's had two or three promotions. He got his MBA during COVID, and he said he said the one thing I love about Linkage is that I'm discovering new skill sets, and I'm allowed to test and learn and try and fail. 
none of my friends talk about their jobs that way. And so when you hear feedback like that, and I, I, you know, I give credit to our, you know, to our entire leadership is like, that's the kind of culture that creates, I hope, uh, a willingness to want to stay. And when you don't have it and look, an acquisition is hard because the question is what's going to happen to us in our culture. And then, then it's like, well, we aren't going to have our culture the same way it was, but we will need to move in and help to create, um, you know, the evolution of culture. That was my question, kind of a clarifying question, similar to how I did with Jeremy. How has that kind of been brought together or been tested or renewed or or blended with the integration and the acquisition? How did you accomplish that? And yeah. talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned in that process and, and how this applies. Yeah, well, it's it, look, we were the acquired, right? So we were moving into a much bigger company with a, a very well established culture. And so it it was, you know, we were still a subculture as yeah. we went through the integration. And then we started, you know, moving teams into the bigger organization called Sherm. And they've got very well established values that are, um, you know, celebrated and honored. It's just they're different than what we came from. And so we are now assimilating into, into the Sherm culture while still preserving, um, you know, what what was working with when our cult, with, within our culture that we could potentially bring. And we're still in the messiness of all of that. I'd say we're a year in, but I think it takes many years to like, kind of reestablish. And I know, Jeremy, it sounds like you've had some experience with M&A that, that may have not gone as you expected. Um, but at some point you have to say, this is the, this is what we need to create in our combined culture going forward. And we hope you will come with us. I mean, there were people that chose not to come with me because they didn't want, they didn't want that evolving vision and that evolving culture that was required. And they opted out or I opted them out and asked them to potentially consider or to consider another job. Yeah. And that's an important part of the leadership journey as well. Thank you for your big voice to that, Jennifer. Doug, coming over to you on this topic. Yeah. And I think if I understand the question, you know, how does culture really impact uh, your strategy. And uh, we like a little twist on the old Peter Drucker phrase, and it's that culture feeds strategy breakfast. You know, we've all heard that it eats it, but um, they really do go hand in hand. Uh, and your culture should really nourish your strategy. And so one of our strategies is kind of having an altruistic approach uh, with our customers. And so as we service their home for pest control, we might take their garbage cans back or ask them if we can fill up their dog bowl or take their newspaper and just in general in, in our communication. And what's interesting about that is, is uh, how did that impact things in 2023 and, and hiring and our strategy? You know, People kind of catch wind of those things and they understand what it means to work for an organization that places value on certain things like that. And so there was this ripple effect that happened, I think, because that was part of the, the culture and it, and it fed into the strategy. So kind of along that line now, Doug, when you're about to qualify in that, when you think about expanding your different locations and you said different locations, different states, when you think about expand the rapid expansion of your team that you've gone through over the last couple of years and what you see going forward, how is culture infusing that hiring, that assimilation, that mat, that you know significant speed of growth that a lot of companies are frankly seeking, but struggle to find? You, you've gotten it. Uh, that, that's that's really difficult to do, um, you know, especially at the speed. And so we live by, you know, we say you you teach what you tolerate, what you communicate and what you demonstrate. And so I think that uh, as, as far as tolerating things, you know, you address things that are contrary to your values, your policy, your culture, as soon as they come up. Uh, as, as far as communication goes, I think um, any of us as leaders, we've all had those moments where something kind of gets lost in translation. And as you get the feedback that maybe the water didn't get to the end of the row, uh, you re-communicate with your people, you tweak something, you re-explain it. And one of our core values in our home office is uh, to over-communicate. We believe that more communication is better than, than less communication. And at the same time, you know, you don't want to have the communication skills of an alarm clock. And I think that uh, a good culture, it can be drowned out by uh, something that's communicated the wrong way. So you know, what, what is the tone? How is that coming across? And I think in, in written communication, that's a little more difficult. Maybe there's a little more grace there, but certainly when you're face to face. And then the last thing I think uh, to demonstrate in, in that starts with your values. And I think it continues with, with how you model those and, and you interact with your people. So I think as far as when, whenever we launch a new location or have growth, we just, we focus kind of on all, on those three areas. But what I know is, well, this kind of aligns with, with both Jennifer and Jeremy, you've invested a lot in 
leadership development in training and cultivating and upskilling your team as part of internally and as you're recruiting from, from outside. Is that, is that a fair statement? That was the duck. That was a, you, you personally, oh, yeah, you absolutely. A lot of, yeah. I mean, like you, if you're pointing out being a bug guy, you invest tremendously into the development and growth of your people at a level that I would say is unusual uh, when you think about the, the business in a positive way. Like you really, you personally value that. And I've seen what you're doing in that respect. So I think that's something, if you want to riff on that by, by all means, but I want to acknowledge that as well. Like you are, you are practicing what you preach in that respect. You are giving people tools to build their careers, build their lives and, and, you know, show up differently. Right. You know. Yeah. I, I think one of the biggest investments, we have a manager development program and uh, the the purpose of that is to propel you to the next level of your life. And so there's a lot of things that we we teach in that, you know, progress equals happiness, accountability is love, but there's regular meetings and people brought in and, and a lot of investment in um, in those things and communicating and working with the people. And so I think that's that's part of it. And then a lot of it, you know, is, is just investing in in uh, company swag and and things that allow us to get together and spend time together and so we try and and kind of go a little overboard with that stuff just to reinforce the fact that people really are the priority. Yeah, beautiful. So kind of moving our lens outward towards 2024 for each of you. And Jennifer, I know you're having a new chapter. Obviously, I want to hear a little bit about your summary of your book. We can start with you on this next question. But I want to hear what you're looking forward to personally as well as in the business. What do you see for your company in 2024? What do you see for your life in 2024? And also, when you think about other CEOs and, links and audiences of this, What's the market looking at 2024? What are we all collectively preparing for? What should we be top of mind for when we think about, you know, returning from the holiday season here and we and we start the new year? What what does that look like for each of you? And then also what 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 perspective might you share for your peers? So again, job we'll start with you, Jennifer, since you have a very clear uh yeah. call to action from my point of view. So well, I, if it's if it's back there, I'd love I'd love for you to tell me because it actually it, it actually is the quite the opposite. Where and I, look, I think it's important when you for me my word was closure, and I'm saying this out loud to set the intention. You know, when you have the close of a chapter, you have to have an ending so that you can have a new beginning. And so whether it's you know a micro version of that with a big project or a big accomplishment, or in my case, it's a it's a closing of this chapter of my career so that something else can open. I think it's important to just to pause, to celebrate, to acknowledge the victory, the challenge, the learning, and then to spend some time reflecting. So my hope going in uh, into the new year is that I'll have the chance to do all of those things while I then set the intention and create clarity for what I want to attract. So the new CEO role, the board position, and then the continued writing and speaking on on the book. And uh, thank you for acknowledging it. One of the things I am celebrating is the the lifting of of a life. You know, one one of the the, the my, you know my life aspirations was to write a book, and Linkage allowed me the platform to do that. So the book is on how to accelerate the advancement of women leaders faster. There's, we're still only ten percent of the Fortune 500 CEOs, and less than 30% of the executive levels and VP and plus across the across the country in our organizations. And that's been a big passion of mine personally and a big a big part of purpose for for linkage. It's one of the reasons we were acquired because uh, more than 80% of the of the members of SHRM, the HR professionals are women. So that piece of my purpose will continue no matter where I end up in my in my next CEO role. In terms of the market and and the company, we're seeing a lot of optimism now. So again, maybe a little differently from from Jeremy. It was so bad in 2020 and 2021, and we pulled up in 2022 and 2023, and we're starting to see a lot more momentum now. And I think the last couple of years, there's the economic uncertainty has created a lot of hesitancy, at least in the professional services space, and we're starting to see. A lot more confidence and commitments from our from our clients going into going into 2024. Uh, with the acquisition, we also have new opportunity, uh, better access to technology, better access to brand and marketing, better access to a customer base. So for our company that uh, will remain, I think there's there's a lot of optimism there as well. So uh, so yeah, I think I think with closing because comes new beginning with with uncertainty becomes renewed optimism and and I don't know where twenty two so the uncertainty is actually I, my hope is I can embrace it 
and um, be comfortable not knowing exactly what is going to happen. And that's okay. Well, thank you for acknowledging the realness of that as well. And for what it's worth, we're excited to support you on that next chapter and amplifying your voice. So uh, it's, a, it's a noble mission and we want to help. So Doug, Jeremy, thoughts on that question, your life, your business, the market, 2024, what's it look like for you? What are you excited about? What are you challenged with? What should others be thinking about? Sure. I'll dive in. Uh, I mean, 2024, uh, as, as a bug guy, you know, luckily, uh, bugs, they don't care very much about interest rates and some of the crazy <laughs> things that we have going on. Um, so we anticipate another another big year. I mean, we're, we're forecasting to beat what we did this last year. And so the question is, you know, how do you prepare for that? Again, um, how do you catch up from this last season and then prepare going forward? And the other day we were in the office and one of our executives shared a little clip. And I thought, man, this explains, I think, what we've done well. And it was um, uh, Nick Saban, you know, mm -hmm. and he was talking about back in the day when he worked with uh, Belichick. Uh, they were he was a defensive coordinator at the Browns. And anyway, they had a sign uh, and it just was simple. It said, do your job. And I think he's famous for that, for, for helping people understand their roles and just execute on their roles. And so as he shared that, I, I couldn't help but think, man, um, part of handling a lot of the growth is just helping people understand their roles and helping them do their job. And so I think that it's really critical to, to outline what those roles are and then have clearly defined goals and objectives. And then we, we have a big meeting coming up in February. We call it the Synergy Summit, where we bring ops, sales, you know, home office all together under one roof. And it's a, it's a big three day event where, you know, we, we take everything that we're supposed to accomplish and we, we kind of get a plan of act, a plan of action and, and uh, prepare to execute on that. Congrats with that. I'm going to dig in more at that. I like Chris Denver's comment. <clears throat> Back to that question, dig in just a moment, but come over to Jeremy. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that question. Boy, 24. Um, I'm envious of your uh, of your growing businesses. Um, <laughs> you know, we we were growth for so long, and it's and 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 we have a team that's built for growth, uh, but not an environment uh, in in the industry that we're in that's that's built for growth currently. So, you know, I, I think it I think it forces me to 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 think differently about what winning looks like this year. Um, you know, our category our category has been in recession for uh, almost 24 months now. And uh, I, my expectation is that it's not going to turn around next year. Uh, Twenty five feels like like pro probably more more realistic timing. And then I think in the in the broader macro, it is uh, it's likely that next year's is soft from the consumer perspective. And um, and so so I don't look at next year and believe that we're going to be high fiving from a business performance perspective. Like we're 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 not gonna we're not gonna be who we need to be next year. Doesn't mean that there won't be some performance wins along the way. There will be. We're gonna have to find uh find and acknowledge and celebrate those. But I I, I think it forces me to think a little bit differently around what what are the milestones that are important. Uh, if it's not the stock price, if it's not the P and L, uh, what are the uh, what are the what are the rally cries for the team? that uh that they can get behind because it, it it could be if you just step back and think about the space that we're in and what it may look like 12 months from now it's hard for me to believe that like independent of other things that get the team fired up that we would be anything but slightly depressed 12 months from now i mean like we are just built to grow and i think it's a hard environment for us to grow in yeah. uh so you know there there are there are a few things that 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 I think about that I think are meaningful from from a team perspective to to really get get us excited and make sure that we're showing up with uh, with with wind in our sails. Um, and, and I would say I would start by saying, you know, we're also in a market where our competition's not investing, mm -hmm. uh, where 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 our competition's not investing, and they're not seeing wins either. And so, I think it's an it, it's interesting to step back and. And think about how do we make sure that we are investing more intelligently, that we're more prioritized, that when our competition is not investing in new product innovation, that we are. Even if it's not going to launch this year, a product, for example, that that's a milestone. We're doing a lot there that our team can get excited about. Um, we're testing uh, we're testing a new marketing strategy this year. 
uh, in a single market. We're really excited about this test. And, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to test it more broadly because we, we think it's too early from a consumer perspective to in this category. But, but can we rally around a new strategy that we test? And can that be a rally cry for the team? Um, and so some of these investments, we sort of look at it and, and just remind the team, it takes time to go from sort of uh, from, from investment to harvest. If we're making investments when no one else is, although we're not getting rewarded for it today, we will get rewarded for it when these things materialize and, and when it's clear that our competition hasn't been investing the way that we have. So I think the mindset of we're winning, it's just not reflected yet in the business. We're winning by what we're doing and we're getting ahead is important. It's important that the team sees where they can win, even if winning doesn't mean meaningful growth. Uh, and the other thing that 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 I would say it, it, that's incredibly important, we're, we're, we're highly focused on, is uh, is employee experience. How do we make sure that people are coming in and just feeling fired up? They're feeling like they're growing. They're feeling like uh, we're empowering them. That they're getting interesting opportunities. Um, and it's it's actually been. Uh, it, it's going to be a good year for us. We we moved into a new headquarter office uh, six days ago, and it's something that we've been working on for three years. And um, you know, uh, when we had our we we do a weekly all hands meeting, uh, super high energy, <clears throat> everyone together in the main room. <clears throat> we 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 feed the team. We cook. We feed. Uh, we've got a DJ spinning, and it's like it's this great moment. And when I asked how many people had joined the business since the pandemic, 50% of the hands, hands went up. And I realized that everything that, that Traeger was built on hasn't been really experienced by half of our team. Right. And so now that we are back together and um, you know, we, we have this moment to sort of really double down on what we started doing 10 years ago on a much smaller scale. And so, you know, the, 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 the building's an opportunity to to be together, but I think it's also it's it's emblematic of the broader cultural the the broader employee experience that we can create, so that people are showing up and feeling like there's no place I would rather be, and I and I think it's like that's important always, but I think particularly in a in a year where it's hard to anticipate uh, some of the things that that really get us excited about from a long term business perspective, growth and disruption of, of, of a category that if people are showing up and having a great experience and they're seeing these, these wins that we're creating two, three, four years down the road, but we're sort of planting the seeds and nurturing and beginning and they're getting excited about the output. I, I, I think that's how we make 24 great. Well, a couple of things. So thank you for sharing that, all of you. I want to say a couple of things. One, I've been to your transitional headquarters and just the vibe of the transitional space was really cool. And, and, I, and I had that that vibe that you're talking about of why people want to come to work and why they want to work with Traeger. I think it's very exciting that you're doing these experiments. I think that's great. And I think that you guys have a cult following of your customers. I mean, I really, truly, I mean, the brand of what Traeger is building and has built is, is you know, well regarded, well renowned, and I think I see big things in your future, and especially with just the way that you're leading and the way that you've just been really open with with all of us today. I I just really commend that, Jeremy. So thank you for Thanks. for doing that, uh, and obviously here to support all of you. So and to that point, Doug, kind of coming back around for just a second, you know, Jennifer had the question: 185,000 new customers. I mean, that's not an accident either. I mean, like, what is what is it that the Shield companies is doing? to have that level of accelerated growth. I mean, I know who you are as a person. I know what, and back to the role of CEO, I know the culture and the leadership, what you're setting. And each of you is doing this and has done this your way. But I mean, that is just astounding. I mean, that, that, how do we all get some of that, some of that growth? I mean, should please share the wealth, you know? That's a great question. I'm still trying to answer that one. But I think um, one thing that may um, help so we part of we we really believe in setting massive goals and and goals that scare us, and I think that's part of the strategy is the whole concept of um, the bigger the vision, the better decisions a lot of times. And I think um, 
why is that? I think if you if you only want to improve by 50%, there's probably a thousand ways that you can accomplish that. But if you bump that up to a thousand, now maybe there's only three ways to accomplish that thousand percent. And it's not that we expect people to actually accomplish the thousand, but just that frame of mind and that way of thinking we want them to bump it up to that level so that they can narrow their focus and, and tune in on what matters most. And I think that it helps you get rid of the fluff. Uh, and, and the other thing is when you think on that level and on, on that magnitude, you think of things that you, you may not have ever believed were possible. And just that awareness kind of coming into your mind, that empowers you and opens your eyes. And so we see that with people as we we really think about massive goals. And so that's kind of one exercise that, that we've done uh, a lot of, and I think that's helped us. Beautiful. Closing thoughts from, from each of you here. We're going to the last couple of minutes. Uh, this has been a unique episode. Obviously, I really appreciate you all sharing your hearts. What's the one thing you'd like the audience to kind of take away about you or about the culture that you're building or the vision you're building in 2024? So the word clarity is is uh, comes to mind for me, and and I think just building on what Doug just said, you know, to, it could be clarity of vision for the organization at a point in time that is you know maybe three, five, ten years out, but that clarity drives strategy, drives culture, drives you know what each of what it, in, each of us individually needs to do to support it. But clarity could also happen at the team level and happen at the individual level. And so that it's a beautiful time of year to both reflect, and you set this up, Derek, nicely, reflect looking back, but also project looking forward to, to figure out what is it for our company, for our team, and for ourselves as individuals? What is our purpose? What is our vision? And what do we want? You know, what do we want to rise up and and achieve? And so that's, that's what I'm going to be spending some time on with my family uh, across the next week or two. Beautiful. Jeremy, Doug, I'm ha ha yeah happy to share. Uh, so, so, so the one thing that I've thought a lot about uh, over the last uh, 18, 24 months is, you know, um, the need to enjoy the journey even when it's tough. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I I realize as I, as I think back to, you know, the the earliest, not just the earliest, but 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 a chunk of my career, I was so focused on outcomes and in destinations that uh, it wasn't always enjoyable. And particularly when things got tough, it was miserable because there, there were no good outcomes in those moments. And, you know, I would say uh, of everything that I have learned during this period, for me, the biggest unlock was figuring out how, how, how do I embrace adversity and learn from it in the moment and not be miserable while I'm going through it. You know, I, I, I have so many, so many periods where I look back on life and career and say, I'm glad I went through that. I, it was hard. I learned so much. I hated it. I'd never want to do it again. And, you know, I remember a moment thinking this can be hard for two to three years and two to three years from now, I'm going to see my first daughter it, go off to college. Am, am I willing to miss, you know, to, to miss that moment because I'm like combustible inside because business is so tough. And so it was actually interesting to be able to shift my mindset from this is hard. It sucks. I can't wait for this to end to this is actually really, this is an interesting, complicated, unique challenge to solve. And I'm not only going to enjoy solving it, but I know who I'm becoming because I'm going through it. And that was that 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 was like that was a life changing life changing experience for me. That's like a life guide's testimonial right there. I couldn't ask for a better answer to that question, Jared. We're going to jam on this in so many different ways. And thank you, Doug. Closing thoughts, and then we're going to wrap up here because I know you guys have all. Very yeah, what, one of our thoughts, and I think this um, will relate to 2024, is is grow to give and give to grow. And so I think, you know, part of our strategy we talked about is to serve others and bettering ourselves so uh, we can better others. And part of, I think, what we're worth is what we're doing for other people. And so uh, I think true success for us, uh, I think it's answers to questions like, you know, what do I want to be remembered for? What's my legacy going to be? And I think that true success also has to leave everyone on an equal playing field. And so some people 
I think they tie success to a certain title or maybe the house or the car. But I think really it, true success is what you do with that title. How many people do you influence around you? What do you do with that home? What kind of home is it? And what are you doing for the people inside of it? And so I think with us, you know, even though we're we're very fortunate with great growth, you know, well, I think we're also accountable to what we're doing with that and how we're helping others along the way. Beautiful. Well, again, t- thank you to each of you, to our whole audience for sharing this time today. Really appreciate the lessons that you shared, your leadership wisdom and your vision. Uh, all of you are worthy of such respect uh, in what you're building and your businesses and your futures. And I'm excited to join you on the journey and be a friend and supporter to it. Definitely reach out to, to us and uh, welcome officially to the Rebels of the Heart community and to all of our guests who are part of it. You're part of an amazing network. Uh, and we're sending for once to come in 2024. So with that, wishing you all happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy 2024. And we'll see you in the new year. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Bye-bye.